Earlier this summer, Accelerator for America, together with our partners at the Drexel University, NOAC Metro Finance Lab, and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, published a paper called Averting a Lost Decade, Rethinking an Inclusive Recovery for Disadvantaged Neighborhoods. And if you think for a minute about averting a lost decade, we also have to look in the rearview mirror about the decade that we just left, where America and most of the world experienced the greatest economic expansion of modern times, but that economic benefit didn't go to everyone. And in fact, our disadvantaged people and places, and largely in urban America, really received almost no benefit. And here we are sitting two years later after that and trying to exit a pandemic to figure out how we can actually do better and do better by everyone. This is going to be our chance to dive a little bit deeper into the stories of a very diverse set of cities around around uh, around North America to be able to share with us some of their specific strategies and challenges and opportunities that they've been facing to to advance exactly the kind of strategy that that Marilyn just described for how a local community of any size can shape its economy, how it can build on its economic strengths that it already has, while also innovating and designing and experimenting and diversifying um, its engagement and its suppliers and its workforce in order to create a truly inclusive economy for all. So we're, we're really excited to have our four panelists today to share different lenses on, on how this works on the ground. Well, in the chat, you're going to find a link to our, what we call our B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project. I encourage you to look through this site as we, as I finish up this presentation here. Um, and the B Branch, as we affection, affectionately call it today, uh, was not just a marvel of truly creative engineering. It was a vision for our community, for a community-wide amenity that would draw people from all over the city and beyond, in fact. So in short, the Bee Branch Project daylighted a mile-long creek that had long been buried and created a system of expanded detention wetlands and restored a floodplain, improved um, and sustainable drainage for infrastructure throughout the city, and then modernized pumping systems to move water efficiently during storm events. But at the same time, along this mile-long stretch, Dubuque also created a beautiful new linear park with community orchards, natural play areas and outdoor amphitheater and other recreation opportunities. We also became, it, this area also became a natural classroom for our National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium, the Dubuque Community School District here, and other educational programs. And then the latest addition to this is actually a hike bike trail that connects trails from the Mississippi River all the way to 30 miles to the west to another city that's, that's next to us. Um, we've been working on something called our uh, City Center Innovation District, which is in the heart of our downtown. Um, our downtown, unfortunately, was part of what was called Jackson Ward back in the early 20th century. And for those of you who don't know, Jackson Ward was a thriving African-American community um, that grew out of the Reconstruction period after the Civil War. Um, it was known as having the Black Black Wall Street along uh, 2nd Street, and another a number of Black entrepreneurs and business owners um, uh, thrived in this neighborhood. And then like most cities during the 1950s through the 1970s, experienced urban renewal. First, the um, city and state agreed to put a throughway cutting the um, neighborhood in half. And then another quarter of the neighborhood was destroyed by urban renewal projects such as a new convention center, a new coliseum, and uh, then city government moved its uh, headquarters over there. Um, so all of that devastation has left this particular area sort of the hole in the donut. And so that has now become our focus of how to re-knit our city center together. So Houston's application of this leveraging of economic strength for us goes back to our 2018 bid for Amazon HQ2, along with 200 plus other cities, uh, if you can recall. Houston did not make the long list, the short list, or any other list for consideration. And we were baffled because we knew that there was a strong tech talent pool integrated within our core industries. But rather than being you know, bitter or discouraged at that reality, the mayor's task force on innovation jumped into action to assess the state of tech and innovation in Houston and committed to determine the missing links to a strong competitive tech and innovation ecosystem. 
I mean, from a statewide perspective, we're engaged in a lot of the conversations that we've heard today. We, we certainly have a team that's talking to business. We have a team that's looking at talent and um, supporting entrepreneurs. Um, and we're also making a lot of investments in place. That's sort of my uh, my section of the pie, so to speak. Um, you know, Michigan being such a, a diverse state um, comprised of urban, rural, and suburban communities with different needs, different strengths, um, and different opportunities. It was really important that we were able to um, you know, be responsive, regionally relevant for our local partners and, at, you know, and, and continue to be a resource that, that, that they can call on to support the work that they're doing. Meanwhile, local governments in the U.S. have at their fingertips a wealth of real estate assets that are underutilized. These are dormant parking lots, empty plots of land, vacant buildings in quiet parts of town, or even vibrant parts of town, and more. What could happen if, like our residents, if governments could make better use of those assets that they currently own? Assets that are, are latent many times of the day or even for years. What if governments could generate revenue from those assets without losing ownership? And if that new money that's earned without raising taxes on a single person, if we could return it to the local community in the form of concrete benefits. Imagine playgrounds, new playgrounds, rejuvenated playgrounds that young children could play on. Imagine veterans who are struggling with addiction who could exit street life and enter evidence-based recovery, earn a paycheck. Imagine new public transportation routes connecting the neighborhoods to areas of town that are hiring, creating better access to opportunities. Imagine filling potholes and maintaining our transportation infrastructure. Imagine really getting serious about our anti-displacement strategies, about solving our affordable, affordable housing crisis and investing in our communities. Imagine the equity strategy that we could have funding to deploy. We really believe that to drive change and opportunity, to ensure that everyone has access to mobility, a sustainability, and eventually prosperity economically, that you have to really increase inclusive entrepreneurship in a prepared workforce. Uh, and so we develop a nonpartisan policy roadmap um, to really strengthen these four areas, access to opportunity, funding, knowledge, and support. Um, and this roadmap really came out of uh, we started this in 2019. It really came out of a listening tour, survey work with entre entrepreneurs across uh, the United States to really understand what was the, where were their biggest challenge? What was their roadblocks? Well, as we have evolved and we kind of recrafted this plan this year and re-released it, uh, because we had a recognition that not only uh, do we want to make sure that we drive that change for small business and entrepreneurs, but that we also recognize that the workforce that surrounds them um, in essence, ends up creating those um, impactful entrepreneurs, but also is the folks that keep those small businesses afloat. Um, you know, a core belief at McKinsey is that economies are stronger when growth opportunities are created for everyone. And one example of our action on that front is a, a recent program that we've launched called In NYC to support underrepresented founders and leaders of incredible startups in New York City by providing dedicated resources to help them unlock sustainable, inclusive growth all for free uh, without giving up any equity. We built an inclusive recovery playbook because we knew we had to be intentional and we had already started looking about this before COVID. And of course, COVID just exacerbated the problems and Dayton was, was well behind the national average with regards to black and brown owned businesses. And what our playbook discovered in, in looking at that data is that if we were to grow our black and brown owned businesses on par with our population um, demographics, that we would be able to create 500 new companies and over 4,000 new employees contributing to our income tax, contributing to our communities and investing in our, in our in economic infrastructure and really being able to create wealth in our residents and families. You know, the challenges that exist in, in certain parts of our communities and certainly with certain demographics, these are not accidents. These are things that occurred by design. Government um, and local government were, were part of the problem and they have to be a part of the solution, not just from a practical standpoint, but from a moral imperative. We're, um, you know, one of many, obviously, uh, majority minority cities. Uh, you know, we are about 60% um, you know, folks of color in Milwaukee, 
And that's a real opportunity to um, you know, bring a number of current residents and future residents into um, the economic marketplace, but also into the, you know, the, the place where they have a real opportunity to have, um, you know, the life that they all want and deserve. So in Kansas City, we're taking a very basic approach to making sure we're serving the needs of all of our communities and all the people in our city. And, and I'll, I'll note that I, I think when anyone and everyone who works in this sort of space is thinking about how to find solutions and deliver results, everyone's thinking about something big and bold and innovative. And it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be something that City Age is going to write a case study about. It just has to have an impact and serve the people that need it. And so that for us is very, very low level things. It's having communications and conversations with uh, business owners and business groups. It's going door to door and knocking on doors and making sure that people know the resources that we've got. It's asking questions. Is what we're doing actually helping you? Is what we're doing serving the needs that you've got? Are there other things that we should be doing? You know what? A lot of people who are in need are gonna tell you exactly what they need.